Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We proceed now to our next session, which is a panel titled Art Spaces and Institutions as Sites of Futurity. And it's a pleasure to welcome Emily Jasser, Aline Khouri, Dar Yusuf Nasri Jasser for Art and Research, Mahboub Rahman, Brito Art Trust, and Delphine Boyce and Fatima Bintu Rasul Say representing Raw Material Company. The session will be moderated by Natasha Genuala, Artistic Director of Columbus Cope and co-curator of Charja Biennial 16. Please join me in welcoming them. Hello, everyone. Hope you've um, had a nourishing lunch and conversation. Um, it's so grateful uh, to all of the participants of um, this March meeting, which is particularly special and resonates very importantly in the cultural landscape here and beyond. I also want to just thank Jumana for the incredible performance, which was so moving and grounding. Um, I, I, I'm just saying it's setting the tone for perhaps you know, the space that we need to create uh, within this conversation. From art spaces and institutions as sites of futurity, um, I'm turning this title into a question. How can cultural organizations, platforms, and initiatives be shaped as sites of futurity to position interlinked struggles and communal imagination in times of perpetual war, expulsion, and starvation. Palestinian-American poet and physician Fadi Joda said in a recent interview, I often think that the responsibility of the poet is to strive to become the memory that people may possess in the future about what it means to be human. Yesterday, after the assembly led by Tariq Ali, someone from the audience spoke about the need to address and respond to planetary catastrophes of violence, whether this is in the Congo, Sudan, Palestine, or Argentina, as a confluence, as part of being in a fractured global humanity. In recent months, I've also been returning to these words by bell hooks in a time where cultural institutions, especially in the so-called global north, have also become realms of instilling fear of diverse perspectives, instilling active cultures of silencing, ousting cultural workers. And her words resonate importantly for so many of us. No insurgent intellectual no dissenting critical voice in this society escapes pressures to conform. We are all vulnerable. We can all be had, co-opted, bought. There is no special grace that rescues any of us. There is only a constant struggle. With these words, I welcome the compelling practitioners who are among us for the kind of vision and strength that they instill in us with their practices. Dar, Jas Dar Yusuf Nasri Jasser for art and research, represented here by Emily Jasser and Aline Khoury. This is the second time I'm moderating a conversation with them. It's a huge pleasure to have you here um, as artists, cultural managers, um, cultural leaders. We also have with us um, Raw Material Company, who many of you know have been doing such incredible, important work as a center for art, knowledge, and society based in Dakar since 2008. We will talk about many of the formats that make Raw Academy the unique institution that it is for Senegal and across Africa. We also have um, dear friends from Bangladesh, Britto Arts Trust, um, here represented by Mahbubu Rahman, artist, cultural organizer, and I would say also Tayeba Lippi, um, beloved artist and cultural organizer. We're so grateful to have you here. Brito is an artist-run nonprofit 
collective that was founded in 2002 and again continues to reinvent itself with new forms of collectivity within the, uh, the landscape of the Bangladesh Delta and beyond in South Asia. Thank you so much, everyone. Really looking forward to hearing you. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Emily, and this is my colleague, Aline. And um, before we start, we just wanted to thank the Sharjah Art Foundation and everyone who has put such great effort into making this happen, happen and bringing us here. Um, even while uh, we live this contradiction of the feeling, dealing with conflicting emotions because we're, we're very happy to be here, but it's also obscene to be sitting here um, in front of all of you drinking water while our people are being genocided. Um, at the same time, um, it, it's been so important for us to be here with so many of our colleagues, collaborators, and community from Palestine all together in this space, particularly because in Palestine, it would be impossible for all of us to gather the way we've gathered here. Um, I want to just begin by um, noting two things about where we operate. Um, we often say we're, we're co-directors of Dar Jasser, but I'm not really sure if that's what we are because we, we feel more like we're um, facilitators, mentors, collaborators, I'm not really sure. But anyway, we facilitate this space in Bethlehem in the Southern West Bank. And there are two things about Bethlehem which make it quite particular. Um, one is, is that after Oslo was signed, um, Bethlehem went into a process of um, uh, like de, de development. So um, if you compare it to a city like Ramallah, they went in two very, very, very different directions. Bethlehem went through this intense process of de development, and we live in the uh, we have the highest unemployment rate in Bethlehem in Palestine after Gaza. The other thing that would be really important to talk about in terms of Bethlehem is Bethlehem also has a very unique um, and special and over a hundred year old um, relationship with Santiago in Chile, where half a million Palestinians live, but also with Colombia, with San Salvador, and with Peru. These uh, interactions and relations are very much still alive today and in a lot of our work and networking, we are building on networks that have been ongoing for over a hundred years. Um, uh, so we're located, uh, we, we see the photo in front of us uh, from the street. Um, Emily was saying that we're located in Bethlehem, and Bethlehem is actually was always considered a sister city to Jerusalem. The road that we're on is a historic main route that connected uh, Jerusalem to the south, to Hebron, and beyond. Uh, today, that reality is very different uh, than what it was before that was used for, for pilgrimage. Uh, we're surrounded right now by two refugee camps, Aida and Azze camp, one across the street and one behind us. Um, and uh, we have a, a concrete wall from just 300 meters away from us and checkpoints that really cut off uh, Bethlehem from Jerusalem and the rest of the West Bank, actually. Uh, Dar Jasser is an artist-led space uh, that we work across arts, uh, culture, agriculture, uh, focusing on exchange and research. It's first and foremost a home. It's a family home that was built in the 1880s. Uh, it's a space that brings people together, people that are in transient, that are moving around. Uh, this connection with uh, Chile, historically, people were always coming in and out and hosted in Bethlehem. So we like to see our house, uh, our, our home, as a place to bring artists and community together. 
Uh, this is our team. We're a small team on the ground, but beyond the team on the ground, we also have other members around the world, Palestinians in the diaspora that cannot actually make it to Palestine, but uh, still support us and work with us in different ways uh, as a way to stay connected. Yeah. Um, we host artists working across different fields. So although we're categorized as an art space, as a residency space, we really work with artists from, from dance, music, filmmaking, cooking, um, uh, all sorts, uh, farmers, uh, scholars, researchers, writers, um, and so on. We've been based in, uh, we've been founded since 2018, so we're still a young organization. Uh, we're still building ourselves up, trying to figure out what is our form and structure, so it's constantly shifting and changing. Uh, we host of various programs from residencies, workshops, seminars, and productions. Uh, through our process, what, what, sorry, um, uh, much of our work is a process oriented. We like to cook together, uh, eat together, plant, uh, read, uh, and do certain, like all sorts of uh, informal meetings and gatherings as a way of, for us to process things. At times the house is closed actually. Uh, we play around between being public and private. When we have residents or smaller gatherings inside, we. We try to actually close that space to make it a safe space for all of us to be together and allow exchanges and conversations to happen. Uh, there's a lot to say, but we wanted to focus on a few projects that we've been working on that are still ongoing or have been recent, uh, some videos so that you can actually sit back and enjoy as well. Yeah, and I mean, I think just to add to what you're saying, um, it's really important to us also that the space is women-led um, um, for multiple reasons we don't need to get into here, but that's essential and that everyone that's leading programs is also a practicing artist. Um, and like the way a house would operate, we have people um, that might come in for a few months, might come in for a few years, like family, coming and going, the uncle that's visiting, the house is closed, we're having a special dinner. The house being closed is also really important because um, we're not functioning, we're not trying to be an institution or a cultural space. It's actually, we want it to be closed because there's an art of gathering people. Who is gathering? Why are, there, why are they gathering? Let's um, foster this safe space where people can come and actually ask questions, make mistakes, um, and have conversations that you wouldn't be able to have if it was a public event. Although we do sometimes open for public events. Um, we also have an Ottoman archive. We have archives of newspapers. My grandfather was a journalist um, that we are currently digitizing, um, as well as photographs. Um, I won't talk too much about the archive, but it's, it's a, an important bulk of the work that we're doing. Because um, we see ourselves as um, guardians of this 1880s house, which is still standing in Bethlehem with the archive that belongs to it inside the very home, which for Palestinians is non-existent, practically impossible. Um, particularly in our neighborhood, we, leave, we live on a very um, volatile street. Um, and what, slowly, slowly, all the buildings around us are being emptied out. Um, and so it's very important for us to keep this vitality and active engagement on the street. Uh, so how we run is that we don't really have one line of programs. We have different program leaders and artists that come in and out. And uh, you know, at the beginning of the year, we sort of see this calendar and we slot ourselves in. Sometimes some of us might step back and others might come back in. Uh, so uh, one of our residencies, Intimacy in the Apocalyptic Phase, that uh, myself alongside uh, Reem Shadid and Kasha Wojcik curated between 2022 to 2023 is just an example of uh, one of the residency programs. 
This one did have a start and an end, uh, mainly a logistical reason, but um, there's others that are ongoing as Emily's residency. We have Nicholas Jarre and Marie, Marie Jasser and others that are in and out. Um, intimacy in the apocalyptic phase uh, came as a, after the pandemic. So it was, we hosted the first residence uh, in 2022 after being completely closed off. Um, and in this residency, we really focused on allowing artists to lead and design how they wanted to, ha to hold their residencies. So um, it's invitational. It was made in an invitational way. Uh, us as co-curators wanted to develop relationships with these artists, to learn about their practice, where they are in their practice, and, in ha and allow them to say how they wanted to respond to the residency or that time and space that was allowed for them. Um, we hosted three Palestinian artists and three international artists. I'm gonna just share two of them that are Palestinians, which were really interesting because so many times residencies are offered to artists uh, abroad and rarely is it offered actually internally where in Palestine where you're giving, you know, you actually stop your work or your life that's going on and you, you take yourself out of your home and go to somewhere else to really stay for six weeks at a time. So here we had Lamal Takruri, who hadn't spent too much time in Bethlehem, so it was really an opportunity to connect with the Southern West Bank, and Bethlehem in particular. Whoever doesn't know Lama, she's part of the Sharjah Art Foundation team and here with us in March meetings. So it was a pleasure to have her with us before she came here. Um, so yeah, artists are provided an accommodation and a work studio. Uh, and as part of their residencies, all artists, uh, regardless of what they're working on, it's just we ask them to do one public event where they can share their process and, uh, and projects. Um, and funny enough, Lama didn't come with a clear idea or a project, but when she came to, to, uh, to Darjasa, right next to us was this abandoned hotel, and it really triggered right away uh, a project that she had previously worked on like five, six years prior to that. Um, we're not focusing on production, and now after a year and a half, she informed me that she's finally actually going to present some of the research that she did in the publication. So our work really unfolds over time and not necessarily uh, within a residency period or time frame. Another resident was Dina Mimi, who came from Amsterdam to do the residency. She's Palestinian, but after being away for some time um, and being disconnected from the land, she was able to actually use that time to do field research, uh, visiting um, much, some of the depopulated villages uh, or displaced uh, villages uh, in Palestine. Uh, she collaborated with Maya Khaldi, so it was really beautiful for myself. I hosted Dina during that time, so I was able to also follow the process uh, and be with them during that time. The, oh, we also went to Bet Jibreen uh, caves, which are very beautiful, and we had some singing sessions there. Uh, and this, uh, this residency ended with a beautiful gathering uh, over an iftar uh, dinner or feast. Uh, in the mountains of uh, Makhrur. So this is just an example of how some of our residencies are running. Um, just to, to build on what you were saying also, um, it, in this space, we really love that we have um, many overlapping moments and community building processes are going on while people are in residency. So Lema, taking Lema as an example, while she was in residency, there was also a dance workshop and a sound workshop, which she also took part in. So it's really important to us that these kind of things overlap because it's in these like interstitches of these in interlapping moments that other things, magical things actually happen in those moments. Um, another really important aspect of our work is, um, as Aline had mentioned, um, we have a very strong sound program, dance program, and music program. So, but I'm only going to share this um, program that we've been working on for the last six years. We've been developing a very uh, strong network with the Salento region in southern Italy, where we have do been doing dance and musical exchanges. Actually, you can go to the next. And then you guys can play the video. If you, no, no, I think, yeah. Um, no sound, there should be sound. This, so um, in this video, you can see um, one of our land residents is giving a tour to the choreographer 
and that it's, I'll just talk over it, it's fine, the, oh, with the choreographer and dancers about what is happening to the olive fields specifically around Bethlehem. And this is, this is like part of, when we say we're process-based, this is part of the process. Everybody kind of gets involved in each other's projects. Um, and we cultivate these exchanges um, quite strongly. The link with Southern Italy is also quite important to us because we, we insist that, you know, we in Bethlehem and as in Palestine, we are part of the Mediterranean. We are part of the Mediterranean. We have been for uh, thousands of years and um, there's a shared heritage there that we continue to explore in these dance and music exchanges. So I think we'll just see um, a small video. Of, yeah, I think you have to press the next video too. Um, uh, yeah, just watch three minutes of this. Also, we we make the music, so the sound, the music, the music and sounds that we've been creating at Dar Jasmine. Project, and as with many of our projects, we have a, a constellation network of neighbors that we always work with. Um, the Citadel in Bethlehem, Ida Youth Group in Ida Camp, uh, Rawad. Uh, um, so every time we do these workshops, we, we move around into all of these spaces together as a group and work together. Our colleague at Ida Youth Group, uh, the director, Anas, was arrested in October and is still being held under administrative detention uh, for no reason. Because they don't have to give a reason when they arrest people. Um, and just very quickly, um, we have a, a, a very active land program, um, which is, is very important to us also because Bethlehem ha is now completely cut off from her agricultural lands. We're completely encircled by settlements and settlement roads. Um, Mohammed Saleh uh, is the person I'm gonna talk about now who has been um, collaborating with us for the last five years. We began um, by clearing this piece of land that you see here with the kids from our neighborhood so that he could design and build this urban farm in collaboration with them. And the urban farm um, was, it came into completion in 2019. In 2021, the Israeli army burnt it to the ground so Mohammed and I went back, you can actually go to the next slide. Mohammed and I went back to um, discussing what we could do next with the land, looking at how this, dealing with the fact that this land is under constant attack. Um, actually, you can, yeah, we press Where play. We're located yeah. in Bethlehem yeah. is the most tear gassed place on earth. And so I was very interested and curious as well as extremely concerned about the land and the water of what the chemicals were doing to the plants and if there actually could be a plant that could actually thrive in such circumstances. And some of my conversations with Muhammad have been asking what is actually growing already on the land, right? Because the plants that we see that are kind of popping up naturally tell us a lot about what's going on with the soil, with the land. Some of them are kind of first responders to heal that land. Some of them are the ones who can just kind of live and withstand that toxicity. 
So, uh, trying to bring uh, positivity to uh, such a negative situation, it's something that I always look for in my practice. There's always a solution. We can always do something. I don't want to feel I can't. This is uh, now seeing the sunflowers with the background of Dar Jasser. Because nature doesn't do monocultures. Nature does diversity, right? So we try to kind of find a way to bring these all back to these damaged landscapes. Having this agricultural land around the house is extremely important um, so that we can learn about what is grows in the land, the heritage of the land, and the land itself, in fact, is an archive. It's been a really beautiful education for me as well. And we will actually hit the, the question about what we do with the sunflowers. That's later in the presentation. So his project essentially was um, tr Ardawa, Ard, which is the land, and Dawa, which is medicine. So he created this word Ardawa to discuss the healing of the land. And um, he created a blog in Arabic um, about the whole entire process over the year and a half of trying to heal the land. Here you see the sunflowers that he planted in the land because the land is so heavy with toxins that um, the sunflowers can, can actually pull the toxins out of the land. Um, the last program that I'm just going to quickly go through, because time is running out, is a sound program. Um, it started off with the... No, I'm good. It started off with uh, Nicholas Jar coming for a residency that uh, Emily had invited him to, to come to Bethlehem. And from that project, from that uh, stay, he decided to transform this uh, stone structure outside that was traditionally used as a food storage before we had refrigerators. And he transformed it into a sound studio. Um, I'm gonna actually skip this. Um, and from the, in the sound studio, he actually equipped it uh, and started doing small workshops with children, and it developed into actually a master class uh, course, which he's, he did uh, two terms of uh, over two months. Um, one, the sound studio actually became, uh, was a, we don't have any sound studios in Bethlehem or the Southern West Bank. Uh, it allowed it to be um, to, for people to use it from our neighborhood, from Dar al Kalme College, from all these other uh, arts centers around us uh, to use the facility. Uh, and then through the master classes, um, we were able to bring artists, not even artists, uh, people that, ha that enjoy music or want to learn uh, how to um, use uh, experiment, not experimental, electronic music and making it sound. Um, so he taught Ableton Live, a software from basics. Um, and this second iteration of the workshop brought artists from Haifa, from uh, Hebron, from across Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Ramallah. And this was a very unique time because uh, sadly we can't bring people from Gaza or from the diaspora, but it, it is a special moment to be able to bring and gather people at Dar Jasser every single week, twice a week. Um, we do walks around the city uh, in, our in our street, uh, recording, field recording sounds, and then coming back and transforming those into electronic sounds. Um, this is the group in the sound studio. What's been beautiful from, from these workshops, we've seen uh, the participants flourish. Uh, Reem Khatib actually just joined our team afterwards, after like a year or so. She became uh, the sound studio manager. Ayad Arafi now has become a resident on Radio Al Hara, regularly running a show. Uh, Samid is now collaborating with Nicholas in creating um, an educational platform in Arabic to teach, with tutorials to teach Ableton. So it's really uh, growing and uh, reverberating in so many different places. In Hebron, actually, there's uh, a few artists that are now uh, creating a sound studio there, so they're consulting with us all the time. Um, we did have a video, but I think we won't be able to, maybe just 30 seconds, where we can hear, uh, see the final performance, where um, the participants shared um, their works. So actually, although it's a diary of the performance, you can also hear segments from these uh, music and sounds that they had produced. Uh, 
Um, so we just wanted to end with showing the last big public event that we had at Dar Jasser and just echoing something that Yezin said this morning about um, this is obviously work we, we did pre-genocide. Um, I think it's important to say that. So we can just show the last video. I'm totally Italian, but you know, half of my heart belongs to this land. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. Oh. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that we are very happy to be there and to thank the Sharjah Art Foundation for inviting us. We have a, a long story with the foundation as our team was part of several programs already before us. It's the first time for us. Um, we would like to thank Natasha also for uh, trusting us and to tell her that we were touched and very interested by the subject of this panel, as it is exactly what led Koyo Kuo, our founder, to the creation of Raw Material Company. Before that creation in 2009, she had been invited by David Ajay as a co-curator on the exhibition Geographic at Beaux-Arts Belgium, and she developed a purpose on all art institutions based on the African continent reshaped art history and practices. It has actually been one of the main subjects of research and it led to a symposium and publication, Condition Report 2. So we do answer the first question, uh, which is in your abstract, Natasha. How do we ensure the, sustain the sustainability of opportunities, mentorship, and learning of practices through our daily program. So let's start the presentation of our activities. Ro Material Company is a center for art knowledge and society based in Dakar, Senegal. Involves in curatorial practice in a large scale, artistic education, residencies, research and knowledge production, archiving of theory, criticism on art. We understand the curatorial practice as uh, you do uh, in a transdisciplinary way, equally informed by literature, film, architecture, politics, cooking, uh, fashion, and diaspora, and so on. <laughs> and there on the picture, you see the space as it was at its creation in 2011. Uh, on this picture, you see the space as it is nowadays, since 2016, after the, its first transition time that led to a break of one year um, before a new birth uh, in another area with new programs. RO was founded by Koyo Kuo uh, in 2008 as, a as, as first a mobile concept and was then established as a physical space in Dakar in 2011. Previously, she was living in Europe and at a, point, at a point she felt uh, the need and the necessity to come back on the African continent. Um, she wanted to create a space that would respond to the educational need, but also a space for critical and free thinking, a space that would be an alternative to what had become for certain the heritage of Senghor's diplomatic version of art and a space for new forms of creation. So 
So when it comes to talk about raw material companies, there is also a link that we have to do with the context of Dakar and how uh, the contemporary art scene there developed and transformed through time. When Coyo settled in Dakar in, 2000 and, uh, in 1995, mid-90s, Dakar was a vivid scene of uh, artistic creation. The president Leopold Sédar Senghor, along peers, did develop with Aimé Césaire and uh, Léon Gontran Damas the concept of negritude, and his cultural policy was the space for it to be unfolded somehow. Uh, one of the elements uh, that we link to that is the Congress of African um, of Black Artists and Writers that happened in Paris in 1956, but also in 1959 in Roma, that set the stone for the Festival Mondial des Arnec that was after he took the lead of the country developed in Dakar in 1966. He did develop several infrastructure, a National School of Art, a National School of Architecture, museums, theaters, but really rooted into a system and in connection with how, what he has been gifted with, don't the French academical system. Uh, this was happening in Dakar between the 60s and uh, the 80s when he left and he dropped the power. Different projects were uh, created and different artistic initiative was developed at that time and in opposition or in counterpower of what Senghor was developing as a cultural policy, different artist collective emerged in the context. One of the elements of Senghor's legacy was the Biennale de Dakar. It happened after he left the country, after he left the, the power, and, uh, but it was in her, let's say, little papers. And this international Biennale made Dakar, in a certain way, a kind of uh, center for the artistic creation and um, the contemporary art field. So the Biennale takes place at the beginning as a literature and art Biennale, and from time to time, the Biennale takes shape now as a contemporary art Biennale. The uh, raw material is involved in this Biennale of, for this off program, but the Biennale is happening since, since 1991 and has happened so far since its beginning, except during the COVID period. It's a specific moment in Dakar every two years, but in raw especially, with um, artistic uh, institutions that are in Dakar and also the private sector, it is also a way to create an off program that give us space in order to unfold our programs and uh, the different practices we are having here at Rowe. The Rowe Residency Program is uh, at the core of what we are doing. Since Rowe exists in 2008, the Rowe Residency did host different kind of profile of people, researchers, artists, creators. It is housed for uh, research, but also it is a space where we developed also a production residency. And uh, it's in Sika Baobab, 15 minutes from the main art center, from the main space. And it's really important also in order to develop and uh, be in conversation with artists and researchers in our context. One of the key figures of this uh, of row is Joe Wakam, Issa Sam, a very important cultural figure in Dakar and also one of the co-founders of the Laboratoire Agitart. When I was talking about the cultural policy of Sangor, Joe Wakam has been an important figure in presenting what was happening in the scene and thinking through Sangor's politi cultural policy. He has been one of the rare who take the courage along with El Hachsi and uh, Jibril Job Mambeti, but also Yusuf Adjan, a dramaturge, and to take an opposition with what Sangor was doing and how he was developing the cultural policy in a very state-centered way. So the collective, Laboratoire Agitart, was a space housed in his home, this at Rue Jules Ferry, who was a space where philosophers, politicians, harvesters, and different persons were invited to discuss and exchange around what the artistic practice might be and is. But in itself, Joe was a very intense figure. Uh, he has been a mentor for Koyo and for the space, and we are trying somehow to follow its legacy. So our program, our residency, as uh, Fatima said, is open to visual artists, architects, curators, researchers, or students from various nationalities in Dakar. It's a way to answer 
to a Pan-African vocation of collaboration and exchange with artists from the continent and elsewhere. And it has welcomed more than 60 persons uh, nowadays. We do organize two research residencies per year, which are more international. Um, it doesn't mean that it will lead to, a produ to the production of something out of the residency because this type of research is more dedicated to a long process. Then we have one production residency per year, which is uh, actually dedicated to the local uh, ecosystem. After COVID, uh, we, which was another transi transition time for Ru, as for many, also because it was the time uh, that Koyo left to take the lead of Zaitmoka in Cape Town, it became more and more essential to develop specific program for the cultural actors of our ecosystem. And in the contrary, so the production residency is giving birth to an exhibition during the parcours. Parcours is an annual uh, program event which was co-founded by Koyo alongside with Moro Petroni to federate the cultural uh, actors of the Dakar ecosystem. At the beginning, it was gathering approximately 12 spaces. Today, it's more around 35 members from Dakar and its suburbs. Uh, we don't talk anymore about spaces as it is composed by also independent curators, collectives, and so on. And the idea is to propose a journey through, through the city by areas. It's very exciting because we have sometimes two to three openings per evening and during 15 days to, to three weeks. And these intermediates also play a role between the private and public sector and also to structure a sector which is mainly uh, informal. Right now, we are welcoming uh, Yasmin Etzabak and Ahmad Alfaour for a research residency. Yasmin is unfolding the intimate stories of the Lebanese and Palestinian communities' families in Dakar, uh, and specifically the link of solidarities between the state of Senegal and the, state of, and the one of Palestine. For those who don't know her work, she has been working in a refugee camp in the south of Lebanon for more than five years, collecting archives of the people living, and sometimes we have uh, grown up there, uh, to tell these untold stories. Um, as ethically, they didn't want to show the pictures which are part of private stories. They dedicated their work and developed programs on the missing images. The Lame group, uh, she's part of, was supposed to join entirely the residency, but was not able to travel because of the situation. Only Ahmad was able to travel. So this research, this research which, uh, which just started, is already surprising for us, uh, as uh, it is developing a link with the fight for freedom and independences of Senegal and the possibilities to continue it. Before uh, Yasmin and Ahmad, we had a production residency, uh, which, as I said, is slightly different because it's uh, dedicated to local artists. Um, I will talk about, uh, we, will we will come to Carol Diop and Zinga Boop, two architects of our ecosystem. I will talk about the links uh, with them to explain how we ensure the sustainability of uh, these artists in residences practices. First, it was not the first time that we were collaborating with Carol, as she's the architect who we knew, who had, has renovated the space, uh, uh, the offices and the, the house of residency. Together with Zinga, they started the research called Dakar Morphos on the metamorphosis of uh, African megalopolis, and specifically Dakar, in 2018. Uh, they had organized an exhibition in public spaces and we had our first public program together at that time. Following this, Carol started a regular public program with us called Citeology, addressing the question of urban plan planning in uh, African cities. Uh, we also referenced them for a series of articles with After All magazine, which led to the idea of deepening the subject of Dakar's architectural heritage. And then they started a residency, followed by the exhibition, and they will participate to a cross-residency with Angar Bas Barcelona in collaboration with CCCB Barcelona in a forum. 
as we usually do during the residency after building a contextualized corpus of resources and a list of key contacts, we like accompanying the artists through the encounters and interview to embody the research with them and learn from, from it. Perhaps what is important to mention within the production residency program is that it's a program that emerged after COVID. At the beginning, mainly what we have was a research residency, but the production is really uh, looking at one person from our context practice, and usually it is people with whom we already start a journey. And it's a way also to connect with many, many people of our context that we meet through the residency process, to the public program making, and that inform our practice. So we develop the program, but the reality is that all the work we do, we did it thanks to many other people on which the ecosystem of RAW is relying. And uh, one of those elements the element on which most of our program is, uh, is uh, are anchored is the library. When Koyo opens the space, she opens the space with a collection of books she had, but she did also uh, find different kind of other resources thanks to colleagues, friends that sent to the library many resources. The library was mainly focused on contemporary African art, fashion, library, uh, fashion, architecture, informing in contemporary contemporary issues of uh, our context. And at some point, we did shape it through the residency program, to the public programming, through the, um, how do you say, the encounter we have with the students and the people that come to the space and that will orient it somehow the way we collect books and resources. But it's, a, it's very important in the way we are working as the resources are not only books. We have many audio rep material archive that people share with us. And whenever we are starting a process of research, you can have neighbors and friends and colleagues that will come up and say, okay, I have this uncle that have this huge archive of magazines that uh, were made by the students of IOSF. Would you like to receive it or do you need it? And then somehow, somehow we build the resource corpus of the residency and the exhibition thanks to those people. The um, row base is also a space where we unfold reading rooms. It is a way for us, we have around 3,400 resources, audiovisual, books, archive, no matter the format. But the reading room is the way that we use in order to be able to bring some of the resources out of the library. So people are coming to visit it, staying, sitting, having lunch with us. But the reading room was created the first time also because we were facing political issues in our context in 2011, 2012. And it was important to be able to bring out of the library the resources we have regarding the situation we were facing and it was also a way to build upon that what the students around the area might need in their research or in better understanding the political situation in Senegal. So the last reading room we did was around the figure of Sheikh Hanta. It was a cent uh, centenary last year, uh, the century last year. And uh, it was important also because the political situation in Senegal is very complicated right now. It has been since 2000. And, uh, 21, but before, we did activate it and we did look at it through different exhibition and program, but the reading room was a material and a way also to express our position and our concern regarding what was happening in the political sphere. Specifically, because also there was this conversation with the students that were coming at the space to do their research and they say, okay, but there, is no, there was no fight in our country because our independence was negotiated. And it was important for us to be able to bring back that there was different moment of uprisal in the country, a different moment by the students, by the civil society. And this time it is also, um, it is also made by the civil society, the political sphere and the students. So it was important just to put those material together and to say, okay, this is what is happening, but this is what happened before, and we can rely on that in order to better fight what we are facing today. 
among the elements of our program and the things that um, we are doing at FRO, we have the publication that are informed by the exhibition program. So most of the exhibition give birth to a handout that people can use and have. And it's another space of reflection for us because uh, it will be a space, for instance, where we can invite the different people that the artist in residency will met during their time at FRO. And uh, it's a, sp a third space. We have the exhibition room. We have the research space that give us any, many, many, many elements, but the publication is another space of that, of that kind. We've been developing public... We've been developing publication around our exhibition, but also around the symposium and uh, the Raw Academy program that I'm going to talk about later on. So, uh, Raw Symposium uh, is, is a program... So, Rose Symposium, okay. <laughs> yeah. But it's welcome. <laughs> Thank you. So, Rose Symposium, uh, as part of uh, as part of our programming, Ro did develop. Okay, as part of our programming, Ro developed a symposium that uh, start from the very beginning of the space in 2012. This symposium were a space to look at our practice, so depending and engaging with different team, and they have been shaped thanks to many of the people who are also in this room. So I will read this time. As part of our constant negotiation and planning with different scales of relationality, being at once deeply rooted in the local context of Dakar and involved in transregional and continental network, Ro has organized five sympo four symposia reflecting on the status of artistic and cultural practice in Africa. So one of the first symposium uh, on building art institution in Africa took place in 2012, and it was an opportunity to focus on how independent art institutions have contributed to shaping the field of contemporary art. The second one was around the educational practice and the way in which we accompany the use of our context. Uh, to address the different questions and issues. It was in 2014, and this gave birth to the Raw Academy program later on. The third symposium on art history in Africa uh, was, took place at the Museum of Black Civilization in 2018, and uh, it has been co-curated with the historian Ogushukus Musnuezi, who is among us, and uh, Salah Hassan, Elizabeth Georgis also were involved, and uh, it happened 
at a very important moment in the work we were doing because it has been shaping afterwards the different exhibition program that we had at Rowe. The fourth symposium, it was called, it happened in Dakar Summit in Bangladesh, and uh, it was called, I'm not mistaken, right, okay. Uh, it was called Staking, Staping Out of Line, Artist Collective and Transcultural Parallelism. It happened just before COVID, and Dilsi and marie Hélène went, and it was an, an enriching and very important moment also in the work we were doing, and we were in, able also to involve people of our network, Arts Collaboratory, with whom we collaborated for this. The fifth symposium will take place this year. It is called The Sense of Place, and we will develop it along with uh, essayist and economist Felwin Saar. And uh, yes, that's it. So I'm going to talk about our regular public programs, the Fridays uh, at Row. Uh, it's a series of discursive programs uh, organized on Fridays. And it's a way to anchor and weave our practice with the community and specifically with the young generation. We are devoted to our context and all we do is related to our context, informed by it and sought from and for our context. But in order to get an agency on the discourse which is projected on us. Um, you asked, oh, uh, Natasha, how we shape the future of cultural production. We try to provide a room for radical experimentation and a room for freedom of speech and criticism. For example, I can explain that uh, last year with the political event that happened in Senegal, university, because it's always the place they close at first, was closed and just only reopened now, but it was closed since June, uh, from June to now. Um, so we developed a series of uh, public programs, for example, Le Désaccord, in English, The Argument, is a way for us to reintegrate, to reintroduce and revive the argumentative and contradictory debate around prevalent issues in our daily lives, especially, uh, especially around political issues. Citiology, as I told before, provides a space to raise awareness about the current state of architecture and urban planning policies of African cities. Um, can I, can I, can I this? Mm -hmm. Then, uh, the Vox Artist is a free space for the presentation, discussion, and confrontation of ideas about art and its practice, production, collection, criticism, analysis. And the Rose Cine Club is a series of film screening followed by discussion. Uh, the Cine Club is also an opportunity to learn more about Senegalese cinematographic universe and to discuss about its future. We developed also a new kind of program last year, the Pen Show. Pen Show means, means uh, kind of gathering uh, around a conversation, but maybe you... The Pen Show has a moment where in a specific village or space, we decided to gather all the communities, all the people linked to the space and to discuss the issues or, the, or to talk about the good news that are happening in that space. So it's a non-hierarchical non space of reflection, discussion, but also to address the issues of one's place. And it's also a way to solve conflict, a sociological way uh, to cross the, the generation on a discussion. Um, and then we, it usually happens on a full day program uh, with several discussions which unfold social emergency or specific subjects that requires a kind of intimacy. For example, uh, this year we are going to develop a program around the transmission of feminine intimacy and sexuality and a program around uh, the, the Franc CFA and the film of Cathy Lena and the economy. Um, and another one around the political uh, aspect of actuality in Senegal, what happened last year and what is happening right now in Senegal. So, yes, please, it. okay. So the row exhibition program has been from the very beginning quite intense. It was the three of them, Koyo, Marie-Hélène and marie Cissé, but they were running a program out of four exhibitions a year in the former space that you see. And when Ro faced this period of transition from 
2014 to 2016, we need to move space and to find another space in order to develop our activities. We uh, start rethinking the way we were drafting the programming and we were addressing certain, oh, <laughs> we were addressing certain elements of uh, our programmation. So we decided to, um, okay. We decided to focus on the Raw Academy program, and for that, we did scale down the number of exhibitions we were doing. This image you are seeing are the exhibition we are having right now on the heritage and the situation in terms of uh, building heritage in Senegal and how we can preserve it, and how our communities are addressing this topic. Uh, and this is a public program that emerged out of it. We did it with the both architect Carol Lenzinga and uh, Carol Job. This one, I'm going to go very quickly on this one. Many people already know the project. So the Spectre of Ancestor Becoming was a project that we did with the artist Juan Andrew Nguyen, who came for a research residency and that ended up in a production-based residency program. He made us meet our community as we, thanks to his research, we we were in conversation with the Vietnamese Senegalese community in Dakar and we ended up understanding that this community was in Senegal since the Indochina war and not having an idea or an understanding of their place in the city and they are at the center of our history. So we've been in conversation with the community, collecting archive, documenting it, being in conversation with them in order to be able to voice what happened and to be able also to acknowledge the legacy of those women who came during the, uh, the 50s and that settled in Dakar for a very long period. And uh, so here are images of a publication that we are doing, thanks also of the support of the foundation, and uh, that's going to be released in May. I have to talk about the academy, even if I go quickly. I'm sorry, Natasha. So, <laughs> so I'm talking about the academy. It come at last. We should have put it at the very beginning, because since 2016, it is our main program. It's uh, an experiential residency program, an educational program, and the idea was to create a space where young practitioners, artists, researchers, architects can be able to develop and unfold the project they have and to be accompanied by people who have enough the beaten track practice. Something rooted in the academy, but not only having people having experience and based on their experience being able to share it. So we did uh, this one incorporated with Rasha Salti. We did some addressing language and the translation as hospitality with Shimurenga. It, we did address the performative practice and the curatorial practice is the one where Natasha was the faculty. The last two academies that we did happen out of our world. Usually the academy is completely rooted in Dakar. It lasts seven weeks and we work with the people of our context. The last two academies happen out of our walls because the people who were running the academy, in this case the Session 10 uh, landmarks with Dual Art, w did develop their practice within a specific city. On the one with Dual Art was on art in public space and it was really important for us to be able to meet the work that they've been doing so far in their space. Uh, they started in 1996 and since then they did develop over 80 projects of art in the public space. Uh, physical project but also performative ones. So some works last, some other no. And the faculties and fellow were coming from different perspectives in order to enrich this conversation and this reflection. So we spent five weeks in Dual Art and um, it was very important also in thinking about the practice that we are having at Row and how this program can evolve. So Row has been developing its program since 2008, and we are in a period of transition and uh, meeting also different ways of doing and thinking as our context has been, our context did transform, change, and uh, it is important for us to be able to address that the better. I will conclude, maybe I will pass this part because I think we, it will answer the question you will ask, you will, uh, ask us during the, the moderation after that. Um, but I will close it by showing a picture of the family, the Roe family, um, and so that you know a little bit more about our team, and uh, I, will, I will talk a, a little bit about it after. So I'll let you, the mic.
Wow. <laughs> uh, now I'm feeling better because less cold now. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Sir Jard Foundation and my dear friend Natasha. It's really wonderful to be here. And last year we came here and it was really uh, the, the, in the March meetings like a uh, cult, uh, cultivating the knowledge and sharing the knowledge and harvesting the knowledge. So uh, I'm so glad we are here and uh, I'm from Bangladesh, Dhaka. I'm practicing artist Mahmoud Oman uh, from Bithar Trust. Uh, Bithar Trust, Bithu means, you know, circle. It's a Bengali word. We started our journey 2000. Two, where six people, uh, I mean, two are not, the, uh, one left, uh, two left Brito uh, for some reason, like moved to another country and they couldn't get time, so the six trustee, uh, Shishir Vatacharya, he's a, a very well known cartoonist and artist, uh, professor. And uh, Shabun is my dearest friend, and they have a contribution. The whole family had a contribution of Bangladesh uh, liberation movement. And the other fellow, my friends, uh, Imran Hussein Piplu, his father uh, was the, uh, uh, you know, the, did, uh, did the language movement, 52, uh, Bengali language movement, and then uh, my partner, Teba Begum Lipi, me, and Masum Chisti. His father was the freedom fighter. So if you see the, the design of the people in that Brito, they, through their family, they are giving, uh, they are giving contribution to Bangladeshi, uh, Bangladesh, the land, language, all the way. So, so Bangladesh, geographically, situated in other, all the way India. We got a small gateway with Myanmar, but politically we don't have a good relationship with Myanmar and Bay of Bengal, the only place we can go freely by land, by sea. And so we, when we started Brito, actually that is actually kind of, we, we needed a platform Right after our education, we we're, were trying to find a space to, you know, experiment, sharing, you know, kind of art practice. Because it, is, it wasn't that much practicing in Bangladesh. And academic uh, process are very, you know, three-dimensional and two-dimensional based. And we have a uh, Shilpakala Academy, it's a kind of art council. But they, they, they do very interesting project from the beginning. Uh, especially Asian Art Biennale, it's like a gateway for uh, us because in that time, you know, the uh, 90s or 80s, there's a lack of uh, communication through the globe and internet wasn't that much accessible. So Asian Art Biennale give us kind of idea what kind of, uh, what, what is the possibility to express yourself to the art. So in that time, so far I can remember, like a very interesting project coming to Asian Art Biennale. Like, you know, the uh, Japan, uh, Iran, Australia, there's a lot of interesting work coming. And there are many performances also uh, happening in that uh, Biennale. So it, it gives us kind of, uh, you know, the uh, and a path to think art is not to the academic process. There's another layers to think about art and practice and to get engaged through the life. So, yeah, that's, you know, kind of and triggering our minds. And when we started Brito, that is, you know, 2002, and to, uh, to help of, uh, uh, we have a network with the triangle network, and we have a connection with the gas work, 
and uh, we have a South, South Asian network. But it's not active these days, but it was a kind of, you know, bringing us to uh, a broader range. And uh, I'm going to talk, we, we have done a lot, we are doing a lot of kind of project like a residency, workshop, you know, I, so far I see all the collectives are, collectives are doing similar kind of practice, and we also do this almost, almost similar. So uh, I'm going to talk about a very certain project which uh, take us to the uh, uh, Documenta 15 and get chance to be a part of the Lumum family. So, the, you know, the political dividation, we talk about the mainstream society, how they are affected by the, uh, that red cliff lines, like, you know, the 47, the partition, Bangladesh, now it's Bangladesh, it was, I know, India divided in India and Pakistan, Bangladesh was the uh, East Pakistan, and in the 71, we got our, uh, identity like you know Bangladesh as a land as a free land so but uh, you know politically we see this thing you know Bengal are divided like Bengali people are divided Punjabi people are divided but there's a many ethnicity ethnic community who are divided by the border you know if you see through the all the lines of border you can see there's a lot of community like a Mandi Murong, uh, Chipra, Chakma, a lot of community are also divided, but we, not, we never talk about this uh, uh, dividation, that broken family. So that is like an idea to take us the project called Prantikir Prakitojan. It's a Bengali word. Most of the project, uh, we give the Bengali name because we have a kind of emotional attachment with the uh, language because we, ha we we fight for the language to get our own language, you know. So that is actually working with a, in a border area. So we all go there and working with this community and staying there. Uh, sometimes there is no running water. Even sometimes we install the toilet, you know. This kind of, and no electricity. But it's quite interesting while we are going there and staying there with a you know, group of artists like on a 10, 15 artists staying in the veranda or making that, uh, putting the tent and staying in the tent. But uh, it's quite an interesting journey to got to know those people. And there's a lot of cultural event happening, which is not in the mainstream uh, scene. And that is kind of collecting, uh, collecting uh, the cultural uh, practice, the art practice. So this image is one of this, uh, you know, the cultural, uh, one of the, you know, the uh, event, it's called Neel Puja, and they, it's a very wonderful uh, performance they do in that uh, uh, event. So, next up. Oh, I have a clicker. Oh, uh, could you? Okay, already. Tantike uh, Prakitijan, that is bringing us to the, this project called Zero West Food Art. Zero West Food Art, during the, you know, the uh, pandemic, it's a COVID-19, people are, the world is very silent. We are back to the home, stay at home, and, you know, enjoy personal life, you know, the, family life, no connection, no, you know, seeing each other, so isolated everyone. And, uh, the, and we work a lot of, uh, with the younger artists. So th all the time we are getting phone call from the friends or younger artists. They are really frustrated what to do. They are stuck at the room, house. So we, we, we bring this project called Zero West Food Art. The intention to grow uh, or make a food and share that food with the neighborhood. Because there's a lot of, you know, 
and news coming, you know, people are you know, longing for food, they're struggling for food. So we thought, uh, why don't you produce art? And that art can feed people. So there's a lot of uh, different kind of project. We make, uh, you know, the rooftop garden or on the, on the uh, alley, we make, uh, you know, we farming there, we planting uh, vegetables and other, and, uh, and uh, sharing with the neighborhood. And uh, some, some people, uh, some of the artists, they made, uh, you know, a different form and uh, taking to the slam and giving to the kids to have this food. So these are kind of project we, uh, we started. So you can see uh, some vegetable from the kitchen garden or rooftop garden or on the, on the street. So these are we sharing with the uh, family during the COVID. And that project is not only producing food, there is a, the healing process, you know, like uh, elderly people, they cannot go out and uh, and you know, Dhaka is very crowded, highly uh, dense city, and uh, people are stuck at the room, uh, house in the apartment. So when uh, you know, the, uh, like one of our project on the rooftop, and uh, their grand grandparents or their parents going up and taking care of that guardian to give, uh, it's kind of healing. You no, know? they are there's so much inter, uh, involved. Uh, to uh, take care of the garden, that makes them, you know, more free and more, you know, kind of relaxed. And also, uh, we are so scared to uh, about the food, and we, uh, and the, from the beginning, we try to preserve the food. And thinking, you know, we need to uh, have a you know, food bank kind of things. So we uh, we. Uh, uh, use a different technique how to, uh, we learn different technique how to preserve the food and we preserve them. And, uh, and the very painful part, like uh, this one, the, it is uh, um, it's a kind of uh, uh, take care center and in the, in the brothel, because in the brothel, they you know, putting their kids in that take care, uh, daycare center but uh, there is n it's a, it's a close. There is no uh, enough food for the kids. So one of the participants, he, she, he got got to know that uh, this is the this this project is not working. So he decided to collect the milk and sugar and distribute to that uh, you know center. So these kind of things are uh, we are doing and and. Out of uh, Tetra Pak, he made a puppet for those kids. So next, yes. So you can see the you know whatever we are getting in, you know next to us, we are trying to plant uh, in that uh, you know uh, bucket or. Yeah, and. Uh, that, that project was sharing uh, with uh, each other to the Zoom meeting. And, uh, and we, we trying to you know, uh, make a uh, compile uh, kind of book. So everybody uh, shared their experience because we don't see each other. So through the Zoom, we are connecting, uh, uh, collecting those materials uh, to make a, a book of this project. And that zero waste food art bring a, uh, get a kind of idea to make a uh, Paghor and Palan project. Paghor means kitchen. Kitchen, uh, we uh, say it's uh, more like a living room because mom is cooking at the kitchen and the neighborhood coming to uh, the kitchen to share their, you know, their feelings, their knowledge. So it's more, and Kids also going to the kitchen, having food and sharing uh, the family life. So it's more intimate uh, 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 space for us. So we thought uh, uh, when we uh, 
got uh, the invitation for the uh, Documenta 15. So we decided to make this uh, project, like you know, the Pakhor project. So in Castle, there's a, a more than 150 community. The uh, I mean the migrant uh, people from the, all over the world living there. And uh, we thought, uh, why don't we uh, do the 100 days activation uh, in the Pakhor? Because Pakhor, uh, Pakhor is a kind of knowledge sharing space or the, or the space like a uh, uh, very intimate. So we thought uh, to invite uh, immigrant people uh, um, who migrate there to cook their own uh, traditional food or uh, whatever they're missing, they can cook there. And what we uh, feel like, you know, the people when they migrate, they cannot carry that much their belonging, but they go with uh, full of memory and feelings. And then food is a kind of memory which uh, can, you know, whenever you go and you try to recall your taste and try to find the ingredients over there to get that, you know, the, the essence or the taste of that food. So it's more like a memory, bringing with, uh, coming with the memory and trying to recall through the food. So in that uh, Paghor project, uh, the people from different community coming and they're cooking there and just sharing the, that food to the other. And they are also sharing their uh, experience or you know, why they choose that food for this, uh, uh, this particular this event. And they, there's a lot of story they are explaining. So we, uh, we, we have a plan uh, to make a book out of those uh, story. It's not a uh, food re recipe, it's more like a, the recipe of the, uh, their memory and their past. So, the, uh, and the same project we are showcasing in Deria, uh, Deria Biennale. So this image from Deria Biennale. And uh, uh, we add this, uh, there's an applique work which is uh, done by the uh, contemporary artist. And the whole project we develop in the village with the artisan. They, uh, they, uh, the, uh, the materials, the bamboo or the bamboo structure, they, we develop uh, in the village. And, uh, and to trying to uh, engage a lot of people and community and uh, because it's a, uh, we're, we're working with the collectively, and we're trying to uh, maximize the participation with, uh, with the project. And yeah. This is uh, another, uh, these are all the, all the project there. Uh, it's about uh, you know, food and food politics. And uh, this, this project called, uh, uh, Roshud. Roshud means shop. And uh, the artists, they, we have a lot of conversation during the, uh, this uh, project. And they're trying to uh, make an object uh, with a different medium, like uh, ceramics or metal or uh, soft uh, uh, weaving things. And uh, they're trying to speak about the uh, the food and food politics. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll show some video uh, so you can understand the atmosphere of this space. Uh. So this is the activation uh, in the park world. And, uh, you know, they, every day they cook uh, like, you know, 200, 300 people's you know, food. Yeah. 
and the password in the document it wasn't like only the uh, food sharing there's many activity uh, we have uh, organized like in the performance lecture and performance of the food and uh, and the local people and the uh, people from castle they're coming and they are you know uh, taking care of the garden and uh, sometimes they come and they're playing the music over there on their own you know interest And the Roshut, uh, these days, uh, it's a traveling in a different location. And uh, it's more like a, uh, it's a coming in a different version. And it's, a, uh, it's more like a site-specific installation. And uh, it's quite interesting to uh, engage a lot of artists in a one idea. So we have, a, we have a, lot, a lot of conversation all the time. We always sit together and uh, trying to you know, uh, make a, uh, you know, uh, bringing them uh, in a studio and uh, talking uh, their idea and and how to build up the project. And this is another project. This is also the, about the food, food politics. Uh, it's influenced by the uh, cinema uh, banner artist, banner painting. So 18 artists, they stay in the studio and uh, we have a, a research and we saw a lot of movies and we select the movies, mostly Bengali movies from West Bengal and East Bengal. And, uh, and then we, we pick up the image from the uh, film and we collage them together and to develop the, you know, the mural. Yeah, just uh, giving the small, uh, you know, the idea how we are developing the project uh, together. Um, and this is, uh, you know, the uh, Prantikir Prakritujan give us a knowledge about the uh, land because, you know, the, uh, the land are changing so much. There's a many open mind and, uh, and uh, that mind feel actually the ethnic community living there because it's a hilly area, mostly ethnic community living there. But uh, the people there, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how they're grabbing the land and they're, they're uh, slowly you know, uh, removing the local community and you know, they're collecting the, uh, 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 the clay for the ceramics and then they're collecting the uh, boulder for the construction. So, uh, 10 years before when we went, we went to visit there, we, the land was, you know, like uh, the hills were there, but when we go the last time, we found there's no hill. It's, it's turned as a uh, you know, low land. And uh, as I mentioned, that there's a lot of uh, art form, a lot of performance happening, which is never shown to the many stem, uh, you know, the uh, people.
thank you so much. <laughs> it's just a <laughs> little, little bling from a bit of practice. I hope it's enough to <laughs> make a communication with the Vitto ideas. Thank you so much, each of you, um, for elaborating um, on the depth of your practices, the innovative ways in which you have reached out to those amidst you in your neighborhoods, to very far distances across the world um, in varying formats. Um, I think it was very telling that you know we ended with um, we were talking about Brito, which opened in, 20, uh, in 2002, um, and our raw material company also addressing like processes of transfer of knowledge, transfer of leadership, um, the continual ways in which teams are uh, made within these quite dynamic and vulnerable spaces of um, cultural organization, but also forms of organization that are social, that are political, um, in conversation with very volatile moments also within the cities in which you have been operating from Dakar to Bethlehem to Dhaka. Um, and so I just wanted to maybe give you a little bit of time to just share more with us on um, the ways in which you um, create collective forms of authorship and leadership within your uh, institutions, if you want to sort of your platforms, if you want to share a little bit more on that aspect, because we know that the larger organizations get, there is a very hierarchical and formalized way in which um, operations are carried out around the most intimate aspects of creative practice. Um, so how do you sort of keep that social and informal environment when it comes to daily um, process of leadership and transfer of knowledge. I think that one of the things that um, I'm going to take the transition as example, Raw Material Company has been funded by Koyoko when in 2008, and from the very beginning, she thought about the, she thought of the team and the group that was working in the institution as a uh, a group that need to be able to address all the needs of the institution in developing the programming, in running it, and in writing about it. So the way that the institution is built and the way that we are developing the curatorial practice is really connected to that and to the fact that no matter which area of the art sphere we are coming from, no matter what our interested are, the program of the institution is informed by our interest, by what we are meeting, what we are facing in society, and the issues of the society we are encountering and the way we want to address them. So from the very beginning, we have an agency in the way the program is, is made, developed, and we create our own program as well. Citeology came from Aisatu, one of our colleagues who was really interested in the way she was living uh, of this question of uh, how we live in a city, how we build our cities, and for whom we are building those cities, and so on. The disaccord came up like that. And many of the programs we are developing come in, come in the space that way. And from the leadership of the institution, when Koyo uh, went to the Zeitmoka, it was very clear in her mind that the evolution and the transmission need to be within the team. And each of us, we are taken care of, accompany in our journey and the way we are thinking about our practice in order for us to be able to take also an agency on the space, but on the institution and the way we talk about the institution practice out of our world. Yeah, and it was quite a challenge, I would say, for us also. We were we were full of doubt also, and it's a and still, and it's a process. Uh, uh, it's on process. I mean, we are still learning a lot, and it was a challenge to to know how we would continue to, with this legacy and to transmit the soul of a space and. Uh, and uh, it's a challenge, but we are very happy in the team. And uh, the, as I wanted to close it, uh, the presentation, the Row family is really, uh, the, the Row team is really a family. I mean, with all it brings with it, 
it means you never leave your family. I mean, uh, some of the some members of the team they left for uh, to continue their journey on other organization, but they're still part of the team. I mean, they are still involved as counselor or uh, as advisor. Uh, they are still taking part in projects like publication. So. Uh, we never leave members of our team. I mean, it's a, it's a full way in process, and it's beautiful uh, as it is this way. And um, yeah, and Koyo always insists also on the, the etymology of cura, curating, because we have no translation in French actually, and it's the Latin etymology of the care. I know it's a, it's a word which is complicated, but. Uh, um, as I'm involved with the world team since one year, I, I've been full of uh, um, this way of comment dire bienveillance, uh, this, this way of care and welcoming uh, in the team. I mean, I can say um, I joined Darjas is still very young. Uh, in 2018, it opened to the public with the vision of uh, Emily and her sister and family. I joined a year and a half later. Those first two years um, before I joined, um, it was still an experimental phase and it was uh, a bit conditioned by certain funding schemes. And when I entered, Emily actually also really opened up these questions about funding and structure and hierarchies. Uh, and after my experiences with the arts collaborator in particular from my former uh, job, um, we started to just break these things down a bit. Um, so then me and her started actually, we, we st took no funding for a year, just to say. <laughs> it was a big sacrifice uh, while we were trying to think through what do we want Darjasa to be. And that's where it really became a co-directorship between us. Unfortunately with Corona and then uh, 2021, uh, the, what we call like the it's a little intifada with the raid, and now with the genocide, there's like all these ups and downs, which have also been many hurdles for us. Uh, but we've wanted throughout to create a space for uh, a team to grow, where everyone can have, um, can, can develop programs from their interests. So uh, we had uh, an intern that came in for uh, six months, and he, he stayed for much longer. Uh, he came just to help us while he was working on his PhD, and then slowly he's like, I want to do a research seminar, bringing together PhD students, um, and do weekly meetings, and he managed to do this amazing uh, group uh, with seminars, and now they're doing a zine, which we're going to launch in Venice. Um, myself, I was able to later curate a program with Reem Shadid and Kasha, so there's always people coming in and out, and that's where we call it artist-led, so that really it's not dictated by one vision, and instead we see ourselves more as hosts, mentors, facilitators, just like opening up a space for people to, to gather and be. Um, right now we are in a little bit of a transition because we're also thinking like we don't want to be in this position for much longer. So now we are trying to cultivate that same practices of what we had with the, the team because now we have new members and it's growing. Um, and actually one of our most recent uh, colleagues, uh, Reem, she's actually now starting her own academic residency for scholars, for young uh, Palestinians um, who are either postgraduates or recent graduates because there aren't any spaces as fellowships or residencies for scholars and it's always outsourced. Everyone just leaves and very few stay to do research in Palestine. So that was really great because she felt, felt like that was a need that she had and then she was able to actually now open up that space to, to lead uh, a project and uh, also similarly host uh, people like her. So it's, a, it's evolving shui shui slowly. Yeah, but I think from the beginning we were very clear and I think when people come to this space, um, either as participants um, or you know, taking a workshop, instantly they automatically feel safe and it's intimate enough that it's almost always that someone who comes in for the first time to take a workshop like a few months later is leading their own um, project. And we've always been very strong about that, which is why we don't like the, the, sh the, 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 the space is always shifting and what's happening in the space is just depending on the people who are gathering. And we, that's why I thought it was important to mention this um, 
history with Chile, but also um, the history that people in Bethlehem have with uh, um, remittances and guest worker programs in which many people had to live that way. It's a very, very, very different um, economic uh, um, survival mechanism that happened um, whereas like a city like Ramallah had, you know, this big influx of people for after Oslo that just like came in and moved in. You know, Bethlehem has a very different economy and a very different relationship with transnational living and transnational remittances. And so this very much does inform the space and how we operate. And, and, and it's, it's precisely why we are so flexible because most of us have grown up in that bizarre space of like back and forth and back and forth, sending remittances back home, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. Yeah. Now we have like a, a 20, around 20 members, but uh, uh, the members are not uh, always engaged. But there's, you know, the the members' friends or other friends or different uh, uh, practitioner, they are coming for our project and they are sharing their, uh, their idea and knowledge and develop the project. And uh, it's very interesting because we started the Brito, you know, 22 years. So by this time, there's a lot of uh, expertise come up in our, you know, uh, uh, in this uh, room. So we, we have a good designer and videographer and editor. So once we uh, develop any project, the, we share the knowledge and you know that some, someone is really good in uh, filming. So they, they, they give the in input for the project. And, the, and once we all sit together, it's automatically one influence to other, and uh, and and they come up with uh, not the particular, you know, the uh, the practice like a particular medium practice or uh, the process. They try to uh, engage different uh, uh, method in their art practice, and uh, the mess, most uh, you know interesting part is we really love food and. We love to cook. So all our members, they're really good cook. Even I'm, I'm most bad cook. If I cook, I can manage. <laughs> so the, that, that, that is actually kind of bringing us together. And uh, we love party also. And the party for us, I, I think that's the most important to boost up artists to be you know, together and bring some... No something, you know, from nowhere. Thank you so much for sharing um, these facets. Also thinking really between hospitality and hostility. There's so much written on these paradoxes of how artists have created spaces of learning, spaces of hospitality, um, consistently amidst uh, facets of um, hostility playing out um, on an everyday basis, on exceptional grounds. Um, and so I, I kind of also wondered how so many times you have uh, larger institutions, um, cultural institutions, museums, often coming into these very intimate spaces that are led by artists, um, collectively organized, grassroots, creative spaces. And these institutions that do have much more resources um, and a certain kind of um, process in which there, there can be an imbalance often in their entry, um, in the kind of negotiations, in the sort of collaborations uh, when uh, cultural bodies of different scales interact. Um, and since, you know, I'm thinking also of Brito having taken part uh, in Documenta 15, of course it was a very special edition led by artists um, but I, I would also like to get into, you know, some of the difficult questions, really, of what happens when our nonprofit platforms that are run, really, by our labor and our personal economies transact with 
very formal large scale cultural infrastructures, often again um, in parts of the world that are resourced differently, that have different politics. I think, that, can I go? Okay. Uh, we face that a lot, specifically these past few years, where uh, there is a very important interest in what is happening, uh, if I take the example of Dakar in the African continent, and many institutions are coming up for international collaboration, thinking about, oh, could you bring the academy here for three months, or how does it work? They don't have an idea of the economy of those projects, and also what kind of resources, human resources, energy, and uh, it needs to exist in the space. And I think what is important is also to set the, the balance of negotiation in terms of do we want to collaborate with this institution and how, under which condition. It's a hard process. Sometimes you just say no, and it's very for political principal reason, but also because the, energy, the, the institution in itself needs to exist within its own geographical context. And we've been invited in international collaboration. We did accept some of them. The one you've seen there was with the Conferin and the other with La Casa. We've been doing that since a while, but in a very less important scale than now. And uh, one of the things that was challenging for us was to find the balance between those projects that will, at some point, yes, bring a bit of funding, but not what to sustain your institution, and uh, that will demand a lot in terms of mobilize, mobilizing the team, in terms of reporting, uh, administration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So finally, uh, something like. Uh, let's say one month or two weeks projects can take, in terms of resources in your institution, one year of processing, building it, two years of processing and building it. And we came up at this, uh, this, this conclusion that perhaps collaboration and international collaboration can be good, but not at the expense of our own geographical context and our own institution and team members in terms of, uh, how do you say, uh, health, mm -hmm. and also uh, you have to negotiate the energy within your team, how it's circulated, and uh, which kind of resources they can put in this project and, and, and in their own life. Our institution, our living space, it is basically the space where we have our families, uh, when we have a loss, we leave it with the team, when something uh, we are encountering happiness, we're leaving it with the team as well. So it needs to be a space of care, and the negotiation is not always uh, how they say, you have to decide that you don't want the money. You just have to decide that you don't need the money. And at some point, you prefer the human beings. And I think, yes, Koyu is always saying that humans, uh, people are more important than things, and it's true. And you face it in a basic daily basis. It's true that it's a con constant influx. And uh, previously, before to be at Ro, I was an independent creator. And it was very difficult for me to say no. And I really al uh, uh, learned it within the family to be aligned saying no when it's not uh, encountering our interest or, or be, I mean, what we need. And also, that's a, that is something we learned through uh, the, collabor the Collaborative Arts Collaboratory because we are working within this, co this collective of 25 organizations. We had the, our last assembly was in November in the Netherlands, and it's 25 organizations mainly from the source, but not only, but what gets us is that we have the same kind of ethical positioning to fight against all kind of domination. And we entered that collective in its early years, and it was nourishing. Uh, we, w we were nourished by the reflection uh, and the conversation going, to in, going in the collective. And of course, what gave us is that we are devoted to our context, but also that we have learned to foster endogenous practice and develop system of solidarities uh, together. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything which was just said, but also just to add that, I mean, for us, our strength precisely res resides in the fact that we're s a small, intimate place. We work in a very bespoke way with artists and that we protect that. So we do say no um, to these kind of things. And um, 
when Eileen mentioned that year that we spent together kind of like unpacking the processes and the way, uh, and, and, and actually we're always in continuing, continuous discussion. How are we doing it? Why is it called this? And even with team members that flow in and out. So it's been really, and also in Bethlehem, we're off the map. <laughs> so no, we don't, it's not like we're in Rome on low or something. So. It is a, like a pulse uh, for the big institute, the collective or the small initiative is a pulse. And once this pulse added to the big event, it gives you a you know, different essence. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and when we do work, it's a totally unconditional, uh, you know, the un unconditional way. So we, we really uh, uh, love to share love and happiness and knowledge. So th that gives a kind of different twist to the artist to create something very, you know, uh, as kind of real reflection you can see through their work. So that's kind of like, you know, the uh, family, family kind of practice. And we care each other. And once we see each other, we really can understand their, uh, their you know, the emotion and that emotion comes to the people to have a you know the uh, kind of blink you know like people uh, if if that uh, essence is not there so the it uh, the word or you know the crisis will never end it's just ongoing the, uh, I, for you know the years and years people are doing same thing the war is happening but the people who are really thinking about this pulse and then happiness we are all sitting together we are not going for the war like uh, the, if you do the, the, yesterday the tariq was saying that if you go for the war i won't i won't stay with uh, you so the omen can stop the war <laughs> If you just go for the war, we are not going with you. So the art is like this. If you go for the war, we are not going with you. The art never stay with the art, uh, war or weapon. We're trying to demolish the weapon. And it's nice to keep it in the museum, not in the, uh, within our life. Can I just, can I, um, just, just looking at time, sorry. Um, but so that there's enough uh, space for you to respond. Just as a last uh, prompt, um, I wanted to just reflect on even the problematics of futurity. I mean, this is a time of collapse um, in many ways, economic, environmental. Um, a lot of your work does deal with environmental justice, land rights, heritage, really. So not only thinking about the arts, but thinking about the resources of the planet and how these, again, are vital to the making of cultural spaces. Um, so I wanna really maybe think about how even futurity is not something linear. It's not about the sequence between the past, present, and a time to come, but really futurity is something that allows us to think with the long past, um, think and learn from our elders, um, think with ancestral uh, webs, that are nonlinear necessarily, the kind of heritage we carry in our bodies. You know, I really believe that all of your in, in the platforms that you've initiated are schools, really, for a nonlinear futurity, if I can, you know, put it that way. Um, so maybe just as like a final prompt, and anything else you'd like to add, um, please. <laughs> Ok. Um, tu peux parler de l'Académie Vasier et j'aimerais parler de. So uh, yeah, that was for the yeah kind of sustainability. We had the question of all oh, we have the, this program at the academies, and that was a constant uh, uh, question last year or oh, to 
uh, develop and continue the process of the academies. And um, that's how we uh, arrive at the Kunstverein, or in, we, we have some international program, and we develop uh, an exhibition. Uh, it was a collective, a group exhibition, but for us, we wanted to show the raw way, the raw method. But then we w wanted to involve the former fellows of the academies and also sometimes faculties to show how uh, the fact of being part of the academy has changed the practice. And this year, so we have a Carte Blanche, Carta Blanca at La Casa Encendida in Madrid, uh, in Madrid. And then we will um, develop three exhibitions with the former fellows of uh, the academies. And for us, it's a way also to continue uh, the process. When one thing regarding that, one thing that was important is that we've been, uh, as I was saying earlier, invited to collaborate in different projects. And each time, Ro did travel. And this time, the idea was to, sometimes you are just a canal in which things are flooding. And you have to give space for those things to flood. It can be exhibition, it can be different kind of project, but sometimes you can just say, okay, this is not my place and this is a place to someone else of my context or with whom I'm collaborating, and that can create something bigger and something stronger. And this is where institution, artists, researchers, how we collaborate and how we became a family also. We are a canal as the artists are, and when they sometimes within the project you develop, the artists are bringing things and different ways to support also the work that you are doing, and it's important. The um, uh, project at La Casa Encendida is a project that we are doing with fellow of the program that has been developing amazing project and it was their place to be. It means also for us that the academy program and all the program that we are running at RO, depending on the people we are meeting, it could be around the table, it could be around brunch, etc. We can, at some point we decided that, okay, perhaps it is the end of this program and finally you are organizing another because it is needed. And I really think that what you say regarding the past present, it's really that. Sometimes there is project that you think that you, have, you are projecting yourself into those, those projects and things are just happening thanks to the links and the network you have creating. And this is what makes us also a family. Many people who are involved in this program has been uh, this canal for Ro to be able to emerge and grow as an institution today. Um, I just wanted to add that what, the way you asked that question really resonated with me and um, the way we kind of practice at Dar Jasser, um, especially the idea of the, the memory and history in our bodies, um, and how in terms of like our, our dance program, so much of the dance is, is coming from his, it, agricultural movements that inform the dance that intersect and cross on both sides of the Mediterranean. Um, and we, when we talk about Darjasser, we often say that it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation. It's a conversation that continues to unfold across time, but not linearly. And as we go, people come in and out of the conversation. Um, and then I would just only add to that the transgenerational nature of what we're doing in terms of the people that live on our street and our neighborhood is a crucial element to the work that changes the dynamic every single time. I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Um, I wanted to just add to that is that um, these relationships that I've been building over the years, it's also created really strong bonds. Like we really forget also what it means to be friends, what it means to trust and stay connected. And uh, one thing that I've really was fascinated by when I came to Dar Jazar is that there's a large solidarity network that has really helped us stand up in the worst of times. And that's what gives me hope about what's coming next, not knowing what the future is. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Going back home with a lot of energy and knowledge and it's like a, uh, every this kind of event it's more like an architectural form and it's 
growing, uh, you know, growing like a mushroom, and I want to see this, this, this atmosphere should should be across the country, across the, you know, the, the view. So that's really important to sit together and make a conversation and raising a lot of question and the answer won't be end like the answer like a ongoing and con uh, question should be ongoing it's not a structural more regimental it should be more organic all right um Thanks, everyone. Thank you for listening so patiently. Um, I, I know this is not an assembly form, so we can't reach out to you for your reflections and your questions. But um, we look forward to hearing your thoughts and sharing from your own practices with us. Everybody is around for the rest um, of today. So yeah, thank you for being thank with you, us. Thank you, Natasha.